Hello and welcome to another episode of Amazon Unfiltered. Today we're joined by Michael Vizi, an Amazon business consultant and investor from Amazing FBA. Michael, I'm super excited to have you on today. Great to be talking with you. Very nice to be on the interviewee side of the, the podcast table, as it were, and uh, really looking forward to the topic as well. Perfect. So, Michael, I know you're super involved in the M&A side of Amazon, and I had a few questions for you. And the first of them are is like, what type of sellers are looking to sell today? So there's a few different reasons people sell. Um, one of the classic sort of big, big trends, not necessarily so much in the e-commerce space, but in general is baby boomers retiring. So there's, because of the demographics of it, because the baby boomers were born, you know, post Second World War in the US, UK, Europe, when everyone came back from their, you know, war service. That means that a lot of people are retiring at the same time. I believe the statistic I've read is 10,000 people a day in the US and get this one quarter of them own their own business. So that's a huge reason. Um, life events can be another one. So getting uh, children, getting born, you need a bigger house. I know a couple of people who sold for that reason. Um, another one is you're more excited by another business opportunity or an investment, say in real estate or property. I've seen that a couple of times. Um, and then the last reason, which is not a great reason for the buying side, is that the business is failing and people want to get out. So the, the, that's not a good reason if you're buying it. You've got to look out for that. And then I guess the final one is, which is slightly different, the business is okay, but the business owner is just burnt out, which is can be retiring person, but it can be just even five, six years in e-commerce. You know, say for you're in that, that environment, it's very intense. People can just get very, very tired. And um, so they just want out because they've had enough. And I've seen that a couple of times as well. So those are the, the main reasons I've come across. Of course. And what does a sellable business look like in terms of metrics on Amazon? Well, that's a, the $64,000 question, or I guess it's probably millions of dollars now. Um, it depends on you and your expertise. So the first thing I would say is, is not even a metric, but it's a, a filter, if you like, is that you really got to understand the industry if you're going to be on the buying side of the table um, or have somebody who really, really understands it if you're going in and you don't know the industry yourself. Um, so something you understand, that's kind of personal. Now, the metrics, I have my personal metrics. I wouldn't say these are universal. It depends on who's buying and what their risk tolerance is, what their skill set is. For me, I want a solid profit by industry standards. For the moment, uh, I would say an Amazon private label or custom product space. It used to be 20% um, pre-tax profit or operating profit was quite standard. Nowadays, I would say 10% is more common, but I still personally want to see 20% if it's an owner managed business so that I can plug in some, some management if I'm buying it and then I can still see a good profit. Plus it's a bit of a hedge against the profit coming down a bit. Um, the classic things you want to see is of well, an upwards trend in profits and the other side of that equation is if it's too good, you're going to pay all the money up front for something that's obviously very profitable, very trending upwards in profit. And then the question is, how are you going to make it better? How are you going to add value? Um, so really, I would say there's a balance between those things I've just talked about, but also obvious upside potential. So for example, you've got a great solid set of products. You're only selling in the UK. You could sell into Germany, France, Italy, Spain, or you're selling in the US, but you haven't tried Europe yet. So that's one obvious upside possibility. The other one is if you've got a product uh, pipeline of new products that the current owner has developed, um, hopefully in conjunction with the suppliers, if they got that ready to go, but they haven't launched them yet, but they have a good history of, of success with launching, that's a great um, potential where you can pay for what the business has done historically, but then add value and get, get more value um, by growing the business that way. And then the final thing with the upside potential is you've got trimmable fat. So a lot of people have somebody desperately doing organic social media, but they have no idea what they're doing and it doesn't add anything to the business. So I would just cut that myself. Other people might expand that. Again, it depends on your skill set. Um, and then products. So you might have product lines that are just very low profit or actually when you crunch the numbers, pretty much no profit, in which case you can just cut those products out. And that's another way to add value. Of course, that's only going to work if the seller is willing to, you know, not sell you those products. And that's where we get into negotiation. So if that makes sense, that there's no single metric that applies to everyone. Those are my personal ways of looking at it. But you've got to come up with a way that makes sense for you personally, I think, if you're on the buying side. 
All right. So let's say I'm an Amazon seller and I want to sell a year or two or three out from now. What can mm-hmm. I do today to actually prepare my business for that sale and make it attractive enough for a buyer to be interested? Interesting. So if you're two or three years out, I mean, I think really what you've got to do is um, consider what growing a business means. Most people think growing a business means really growing the top line or the revenue, right? But, you know, if you're in SaaS, like I know you are, so a um, bit of a different industry because SaaS businesses are sometimes sold based on multiples of revenue, right? I've very, I've almost never seen that in e-commerce. So assuming we're talking about e-commerce, then you need to grow the profit. So I would say even if you're growing the revenue for the first year or two of your three-year arc that you've talked about, you should be focusing on growing profits each year. At least have profitable years. Don't go below a certain amount. For me, that would be don't go below 10% operating margin. Um, As you approach, so talking about profit, as you approach uh, the last 12 months before you sell, I think you really need to be prioritizing profit over revenue growth. So launch fewer SKUs because that's obviously a cost base for most of us and optimize for conversion and to put your money into, um, you know, better photography, better listing, copy, um, SEO, Amazon SEO, rather than launching new SKUs as you come up to that. Equally, I think even three years out, you need to get clean numbers. You probably want to have three years of clean numbers. Sometimes people in the feeding frenzy that was in 2022 with the aggregators, sometimes they just look at the trailing 12 months. Um, That's not normal and that's not responsible business buying. So as the seller, you want to make sure you've got clean numbers from three years before you sell. Ideally, the profit and loss needs to be clean. Make sure you've got VAT stripped out, VAT or sales tax, any other things like that so that you know, the, the seller can see, uh, the buyers can see uh, clearly what it is they're getting. Have a clean balance sheet. You're probably going to need to work with your accountant for that. And make sure you know about your stock. It sounds obvious, but if you've got a lot of stock, you need to know where eat for each SKU. As some in China, for example, if that's where you produce it, some on the boat, some in Amazon, some in the 3PL. You need to know all those numbers and make sure they're super clean and clear because that's one of the first things that a buyer is going to want to know about. Uh, the last thing I would say is you want to create or clean up your standard operating procedures. And if you don't have any in place yet, you've got time if you're three years out from a sale. Just make sure that your business is transferable. And the more transferable your business is, the easier it's going to be to sell it as well. But what are some basic SOPs that you think most others should have set up? Well, I would start macro to micro. So you think about your business structure. You can even look at the structure of a a slightly bigger business than yours and and look at the organization chart if it's available publicly and then reverse engineer from that. So you've got to think about um, the CEO. So how are you making strategic decisions? Sounds like a funny thing to put into an SFP, but if you can't package up your way of thinking about how what markets are we going to go into, that implies having market research SFPs. What products are we going to develop? So that implies, you know, some customer research SPs. Um, then you you won't be able to transfer the business. So that's the first thing. Then you've got to have a sourcing department effectively. So you've got to think about everything to do with sourcing. That's huge. There's a lots and lots. How do you select um, suppliers? How do you um, order samples? You've got to go through the whole process historically, really. Document that. You've got to have um, standard operating procedures around finance, obviously. And a lot of people are a little bit hazy about that. And that's one thing to clean up. As well as having a strong p l you've got to have a clear SOP. For example, a meeting rhythm. Do you meet with your bookkeeper once a month? If so, do you have a standard document of the numbers that you check? And, you know, document that. Uh, and then obviously the marketing is huge as well. So you've got to have standard SOP. So how do you create a listing? How do you go about keyword research? How do you go about writing copy? How do you um, liaise with a photographer? Do you have a photography brief? When you really break it down, you're probably going to need, you know, one to 200 um, Google Docs or Google Sheets. I, I prefer to use that. Other people use different things. It doesn't need to be complicated, but it needs to be very, very clear. And um, it needs to be up to date as well. So even if you created some a couple of years ago, you may find that everything's changed. So that's quite a lot of work. Um, But even if you don't sell your business, it should make you a better business. And if you end up with some staff that leave and you need to replace them, then that should make it easier as well. So there are lots of side benefits to that, but it's a lot of work, as you can tell. Yeah, no, from what it sounds like, 99.99% of the sellers I work with would not test the SOP test. But no, I know but that there's this. It's okay uh, when you're starting yeah. off. You, you just got to work on it over time. Yeah. I think. You know? Yeah, there's this book that's called "Built to Sell." I don't know if you read it. It's, yeah, it actually yeah. goes John over. Warlow, all of it. I think it is. I think, it? Yeah. 
I think so. I don't know. It's been a while since I've read the book. Do you know of any other books that help people get ready, I guess, or put them in their frame of mind to sell? Good question. Well, my friend um, Ben Leonard, who's built a business and sold it, is coming out. He's now working as a business broker in the Amazon FBA space. So he's coming out with a book in October. That'll be worth looking for. I don't know what the title is, but Leonard, L-E-O-N-A-R-D. Um other good books around it. I, I nearly put one together myself from a bunch of uh, podcast recordings. And the reason I didn't issue it is because I felt it was a bit outdated because everything changed very quickly. But um, build to sell is good. It's a bit complicated. I would say um, another good one is Joe Valley's book. And again, I can't remember what it's called, but Joe Valley works for quite like brokerage. So he deals with a lot of business brokering and, and he's brokered deals over 20 years, I think. So can't remember the name of the book, but that's another good one to read. That's pretty solid guide actually. All right. That's interesting. How about some common blockers of sales? Like if someone's <laughs> trying to sell, let's actually think of it this way. Like before even DD, like someone's trying to sell and can't get any interested buyers. What would be like the three or four most common reasons for that to happen? Yeah. So the first one is probably excessive valuation. So it's a little bit like real estate or, you know, um, estates, um, agents or, or uh, property, as we call it in the UK. Um, if somebody comes and values your house and says your house is worth a million dollars or a million pounds, then and somebody else has said it's only worth 900,000 then you're probably as the owner of the property likely to feel inclined to talk to the person and give them the business that said it's worth a million because that's a bigger number right but that's only an opinion and of course um value is is ultimately what somebody's worth is worth something's worth what somebody's going to pay for it sorry butchered that phrase but you know what i'm saying the thing about real estate versus businesses especially very small businesses is there's not a very liquid market so to get an exact valuation is extremely hard it's very very subjective and what's happened um quite often i've seen very recently a lot is that brokers plus the recent history where aggregators would pay five or even six times earnings for really small businesses say 100,000 to 200,000 to 300,000 dollars a year in in earnings. Um that's led to quite excessive valuations which I don't think are in line with the fact that aggregators are mostly not buying businesses anymore. A couple are but not many. And so the buying um side of the equation if you like says so supply and demand determine prices is true for selling a whole business as well as for products. And when there are fewer buyers, I think that the price has to come down. So I think that's the number one thing I see, excessive valuation. Um, another thing I see is that sellers try to sell excess stock or dead stock. For example, I, somebody put a deal past me the other day where they had um, so much inventory that I calculated they had about, on average, two years worth of stock, which is, you know, obviously basically means a lot of failed products in there. Because if that's the average, then some of the products probably have five or six years stock. In other words, they were never going to sell. And this is when the seller has the sunk cost fallacy going on where the person who owns the business, they paid, you know, $5 a unit for 10,000 units. So, okay, you got $50,000 worth of stock you feel and you want to get that money back. The trouble is if you can't sell it, it's not really worth 50,000. And so if you're not willing to accept the fact that sometimes we all make this mistake, we buy stock that we think will sell well and it doesn't, if you're not willing to let go of that and just write it off financially and you insist on getting paid for it, that's often where the deal will get stuck. And I think that's an emotional discipline of letting go, really. So a couple of others, really, the, the, other, the last three you can bundle together into the due diligence side. Um, first of all, legal issues. Sometimes people are not even allowed to trade the product they've been trading for several years. They actually haven't got the FDA approval or FTC or something like that that they needed, um, which is a sad day when your lawyer discovers that. Uh, because technically you shouldn't be allowed to trade at all. That's an extreme version, but that can happen. More common is questions around intellectual property. So you've been using a bunch of trademarks effectively with all the different names of your products, all effectively are trademarks. And you may discover that some of them, somebody else has already got a trademark of some description or at least a potential claim. And that can really slow things down or even mean that you have to stop selling some of those products. So that devalues the, the business deal as a whole. That's the legal side. Then the financial due diligence, if you claim things on a balance sheet that the accountants cannot justify, for example, the value of dead stock that we talked about, then you're going to have a sticking point there. And, um, you know, so those are the two main things that I would say um, that get in the way of actually doing the deal. 
That makes sense. You mentioned aggregators are no longer buying businesses right now, or at least most of them are not. So who's actually purchasing Amazon businesses or acquiring them at this moment? I mean, to be to be fair, there are a couple of aggregators still buying, but most of them are sort of trying to digest the, you know, the 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 dog that caught the car. They're like, what do we do with the business? So really, that they're still out there, but in less less numbers and probably buying less aggressively. So that I would say that's a subset of private equity, which is a type of entity that was extremely aggressive about Amazon businesses before after that it seems to have been crypto this year they're all piling into artificial intelligence and software so you guys are in the right place they're safe so um but those seem to go in waves for whatever reason um the more stable types of buyers are, are three types really that outside of private equity one is individual buyers um such as myself so not looking to create a giant corporation um the second one is existing small business owners and um, the businesses themselves are sorry we'll wait for this let me do this up again the second type of buyer is existing small businesses themselves so the difference is that the business itself will be buying uh the business so they'll be bolting it on quite often it will be an asset purchase in technical terms which means they're just buying whatever they fancy from the business um and then the third type is trade buyers. And that's kind of everyone's dream buyer in a way, but also a nightmare. And I can tell you why, if you want to know more about that. I would. Okay. <laughs> in which case, so trade buyers. The good thing about trade buyers is that if they're buying your business, they're quite often going to be direct competitors. They're interested in buying your business. And the reason they want to buy your business is they can take you off the table. And, you know, that that removes a huge headache for them if you're a really strong competitor. Um and so therefore, they're normally willing to pay better money. Now, if they're big uh, companies as well, they'll be less price sensitive. So that can be where you make really great money. And that's less cyclical than the private equity investors. I think they're out there. It, it goes through waves. I think that a lot of consumer spending, consumer discretionary spending has been squeezed in the UK, particularly in the US and Europe to some degree. So they may be less generous than they have been. Uh, but the, if you can tell to those, generally speaking, they're going to be the best payers. Now, the downside of trade buyers is two things, really. Number one, if they want to take you off the table, then they may well just get rid of your brand name, your identity as a business. And if you spent years developing that, that may be distressing. Uh, but the other one is obviously the risk is that you go through the process of selling, but you don't actually end up selling to them. And what that means is that they know a ton of information about you and your business and your products and how you're sourcing them and your competitive advantage. So the big risk with trade buyers is that you're giving your competitors a great in insight into you uh, as a business. So that's kind of a high risk, high gain type of buyer. If you can find them, um, they're probably the most profitable sale. But the other thing is it's not easy to find them. They, they don't tend to float around much of the time. Right, that makes a lot of sense. How about buyer side risks? Let's say I'm a new buyer, whether I'm an individual or I'm another Amazon seller, and I'm looking to acquire my first Amazon business. What are some common buyer side risks that I should be aware of? So there were quite a lot. I mean, I would say the first thing is um, if you don't know what you're doing in this space, if like if you don't happen to have sold on Amazon, so I've working with a client recently who's um, sold a business that was more SEO focused. He's very... Um, good at digital marketing. He sold a business for good money, uh, but he wanted to enter the Amazon space. And he was smart enough to reach out to me as somebody who's got lots of experience in the space for commercial due diligence. I'm not a lawyer or an accountant, but I would say um, going into a an area you don't understand and not hiring somebody to compensate for that is, is a big, big issue. Um, the other related thing with that is not hiring professionals for due diligence. Even if you've sold on Amazon for years, you still should get, in my opinion, a lawyer, an accountant, because you're not an expert in law. And just because you know a little bit about it doesn't mean you know enough uh, to know what, even what the potential traps are. Um, and nobody loves lawyers and, and most people don't love accountants and they find problems. But it's better to find the problems up front than to buy the business and then discover that you get a cease and desist letter from somebody, you know, a few months down the line and you cannot sell half of your products. And that is a real risk. I've experienced that. I've seen clients have experienced that. You just need to get that done. So that's the first thing. A um, couple of other things. Accepting um, excessive valuation, I would say. Um, is quite common. They sort of take the valuation as a given or um, don't negotiate hard enough or not willing to walk away, which is another general thing. Um, 
associated with that, they accept poor numbers. So they accept, oh, well, this has only got 10% profit. Most of the businesses I've looked at have only got 10% pre-tax profit. I guess that's the best I'm going to get. Well, my response to that is, okay, if that fits your buy box, as it were, your buying criteria, okay. But for me, it means I just keep looking. So being willing to look really, really hard and consider a lot of potential businesses it's hard work. It's a bit exhausting. It's a bit frustrating. I think that's much better than accepting poor numbers. A um, couple of other things. I think one of the things with e-commerce that is different from other types of business models out there, particularly if you're importing from China or, or India or somewhere where you have things, you have inventory tying up your cash for many months at a time, is ignoring the working capital requirements. If you buy a business and the actual cost of the business is, say, $300,000, and you buy, say, $100,000 worth of inventory of that, well, if you want to expand the business, you may well have to put another $100,000, $200,000 in. And if you haven't reserved that money or raised that money, you won't be able to grow the business. And I think that you need to have that plan before you buy the business, which brings me really to also having a plan for growing it. If you don't have a plan for growth, then uh, you know you can't work out what your working capital requirements will be for growth. So the whole thing starts to unravel. And the other thing is related to that. I'm kind of putting this slightly backwards, but a lot of people just want to buy a business and think of it like it's real estate. So you buy, you know, a, an apartment or a condo or a house somewhere, and you let it for whatever five percent of the value is the gross yield, as we call it in Britain. I think it's the cap rate in in America. So in other words, you let a property out. You buy a property for a million dollars and you you get $50,000 a year in rent and that will be fairly stable or go up over time. That's not really how e-commerce works. In my experience, particularly Amazon, most of the time, if you don't keep developing and tweaking your products to version two, version three, version four, and or launching new products, over time, you'll find that the market share of your products will shrink. So you have to keep growing in order to not shrink. And that means having a plan for growth and the working capital requirements. So you know, it's more involved than it looks on the surface of it. And I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but again, it's better to do your homework up front and have a happy experience of owning the business. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess what should we be looking for? Like if I'm a first time acquirer, what are like some basics or what's like the checklist per se of what I should be looking for in my first business? Yeah, so it's sort of the other side of the table to the sellable business, really. So I think understand the industry and or have some really trusted people as part of the deal team that can evaluate it for you. I Preferably part of the operating team as well, because once you've bought the business, somebody's got to operate it. And if you don't know how to operate a business, you can learn. But to your point, most Amazon sellers that are um, owner managers, you know, solopreneurs or a tiny team haven't really documented things extremely well. And so there will be lots of undocumented assumptions that you will have to learn the hard way if you don't have somebody on your team who understands it. So, um, again, it comes down to buyer to business match, really. So understanding the industry. Uh, solid profit, for me, that's upwards of 20% um, pre-tax profit if it's um, owner managed, at least, preferably more. An upwards trend in profit, I prefer to see that. And then obvious upside potential Again, can you go into new markets with the same products? Is there a new market? Um, are there new products you can easily launch that are already sort of half prepared? Maybe you've even got samples or designs. And um, is there trimmable fat? Those two things are in opposition, by the way. So you know, I prefer personally to have a solid business, but that's not amazing, and then have some obvious room for growth. Other people might prefer to buy a pay quite a lot of money for a really fantastic business that's already growing and they have less work to do but there's less upside potential and there are people who would deliberately look for distressed businesses and buy them for a dollar and then try and turn them around so different people really have different skill sets and mindsets and personally i don't want to do turnarounds but i know people that that do that it's high risk high game right you pay a dollar that sounds great but if you inherit two hundred thousand dollars of debt and you can't turn it around you're going to be in bankruptcy pretty quickly and you need to be prepared for that possibility as well. So again, it varies. My personal criteria is somewhere in, in the middle. I come from the software world. So for us, usually if you get acquired, you have to stay on for a few years to help the new parent company sort things out. Is mm. that normal for Amazon sellers or is it just like, here's your sack of money and go away? Well, um, that's always a point of negotiation. So most sellers just want to get the sack of money up front and walk away. And of course, an intelligent buyer will insist on not doing that. So I would say it's quite common to have somebody stick around for 90 days, which is, I think, a pretty short time to learn a 
you know, as we know, quite a complex business model, right? You've got the whole online marketing side, you've got the whole physical products creation and and um, freighting side, international logistics, and you've got fulfillment. But none of these are casual uh, problems to solve. So I think if you can negotiate, even if you're willing to say have 90 days included in the deal, and then you're willing to pay the the existing business owner to stick around as an employee or as a consultant, I think it's really worth doing that. And by the way, you need to be careful of using an SBA loan to buy the business, which a lot of people do in America. Um, I only wish as a Brit that I had access to that, but uh, you can partner with an American if you don't have access personally. But in that case, you need to be very careful that the original owner of the business is not allowed to stay unemployed beyond a certain time frame. So you just need to look out for that. But that nuance aside, I think the longer you can keep them on, the better really in some ways. How do deal structures work? Because in the software world, you usually get an earnout, So you've got a bunch of money up front, then it's kind of performance based. So if you had a certain revenue goal or a certain number of users or whatever your metric is, you start to get your payout over time. Is that how it works with Amazon sellers or is all the money just paid up front? Great question. So a lot of people who are selling businesses expect the money just up front because that's kind of I guess what they have an expectation in their mind somehow because that's what they've experienced if they sold property or real estate before. Um, that can happen. I would say there are three deal structures that are possible. One is all the money up front. I, I wouldn't advise any buyer to do that. If you're a seller and you can get it, then obviously there's less uncertainty, but you'll get a lower multiple. The second thing you're talking about is an earn out. There's, a, there's another option, which is called a diff, um, deferred um buyout i think or a deferred payment which is to say that the money is not dependent on the performance of the business but it's simply structured over time so quite often you'll have something like um 70 percent of the business <coughs> sorry 70 percent of the um, money for the business is paid up front um effectively in cash and then maybe 30 percent one year later now that's not quite the same as an earnout, which is a different thing which as you said is dependent on the performance of the business that's not so common in e-commerce but it can happen and if the seller of the business really wants a higher multiple, a higher value of the business, then uh, quite often the the buyer will say, "Okay, well, look, we'll you can have an option of three times earnings um, in year one, or four times earnings split between year one and year two as deferred payment. That's guaranteed money. Effectively, there may be some." conditions around that there often are especially if they got some legal issues which is why i'm saying you need to sort the clean up the ip if there's some question marks around that there might be what's called a hold back which is slightly different again but then the earn out if you want to earn bigger money they might say okay we'll give you you know x amount for the first two years and then in year three if it hits certain metrics probably based around profit rather than revenue but it can be negotiable then yeah you get the earn out so there are various different options and this is one of the things where um if you're a savvy seller, you've got to think about your own risk profile and, you know, money up front versus the overall money you may get and how much you trust the buyer to operate your business comes into that, of course. If you're on the buying side, then I would say don't be rigid about the multiple you pay for the business. I think it doesn't matter if you pay a lot of money for the business in absolute terms, um, as long as the cash flow of it makes sense. If you spread it over time, then that enables you to do a lot of things you can't otherwise do. For example, the working capital stays in your bank account, which you can then use to grow the business by investing in new product lines rather than giving it all to the seller in one go and then sitting there going, right, we haven't got any money to grow the business. So there's a lot that goes into the deal structure, but those are some very basic things. Do like equity acquisitions happen? Because sometimes in tech, when you get acquired, you don't actually get cash. You just got stuck in the new acquirer company. Does that ever happen with Amazon or is it you know mostly what? It's cash very based? It's very unusual. I do know I've got one client who got, um, I think, sort of more almost venture capital type money. So very unused in the e-commerce space. I, I don't expect anyone else to, to be getting that listening, but it's possible. <clears throat> so you sold 40% of the equity for, for a lot more than any normal multiple of the profits. And one option that was offered to him, and he actually had a previous offer than somebody else, and one option that was offered to him there was indeed equity in the new parent company. Um, I'm not very familiar with that because it's pretty unusual. So I guess I would be instinctively wary of that because if you're selling your business, one reason to do that is to de-risk your situation, right? To take some money off the table. And what you've done is you've exposed yourself to the same asset class, but now it's under somebody else's control. So I'm not sure. It depends who you're selling to. If you really, really trust them to operate your business well, I guess it would make sense. I guess in the SaaS world, 
you probably find people with a longer operating history and you can evaluate them more accurately than you would necessarily in e-commerce. Right. Who's who's giving like VC type money then? Because the way most funds work, they need like 100, 200, 300, 1000 X outcomes and some of their investments to actually return the fund and give money back to the investors. And that's probably not going to happen with 99.99% of Amazon businesses. Yeah, I don't quite understand, honestly, how my client managed to get this money. Um, I think it's a very cool deal for him, for the buyers. I think it's very unlikely they're going to see a great return on that money, to be honest. I mean, he's a very good entrepreneur and it's a good business. Don't get me wrong. But um, I think, as you say, it's pretty hard to get that kind of aggressive return. And they have valued the business pretty highly relative to the earnings. But there you go. I mean, I, yeah, it's somebody else's problem. I, I wouldn't personally advise anyone to invest in that way because I don't see how you get a return. But if somebody's willing to sell you, you know, to buy your company off you in that those terms, you know, you got to look into the detail as ever. The devil's in the detail. You know, what happens if things go badly? Who owns the stock? And, you know, who gets first crack at the uh, returns and who keeps the money, you know. And VC is not something I've really got much background in or understanding of. And I haven't sold to VC or bought, you know, worked with VC. So it's not something I can speak to in detail, really. Right. You mentioned negotiations a lot. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, what are some important terms or things to negotiate for both the buyer and seller. We can start with the actual buyer first. Yeah, so, um, yeah, for the buyer, I, I, they're, they're the same things, but, I mean, I guess you'd have different priorities. So for the buyer and the seller, the most important thing to negotiate is the price, but almost more important that is the deal structure you've mentioned already. Um, so if you are on the buying side of the table, if you can have a deal structure with seller finance or vendor finance, which is hard to get but does exist um which means maybe you pay them over five years or something you can basically get a business to buy itself if it's got really good cash flow um which means that you can afford to be very generous in the multiple that you offer you know the actual value of the business um so you've got to weigh up very strongly if you're a cash buyer if you've got a pile of money because you sold a business or whatever you've inherited a lot of money and you're willing to pay it all up front, then I think that needs to be reflected in a lower multiple because there's great value in the certainty and simplicity um, of that transaction for the seller, right? The owner of the business. Because um, if they get all the money up front, that means they have minimal risk that if you buy the business and screw it up, that's not their problem anymore. They'll probably be pretty sad about it, but financially they're not involved. And if you're a cash buyer, as, it, as in you've got all the money in an account somewhere, means you don't have to involve lenders and lenders generally make things more complicated and it takes longer. So I think you need to get a discount for that on the actual buying price, you know, just as you would to a degree buying real estate as well. That's very interesting. So last question here, what's something that I should have asked, but I haven't asked you so far in this interview? Hmm. That's a great question. Well, I think um, really what you've got to think about is having a plan. Have you got a real plan? And I got ticked off uh, a while ago when I was talking to an accountant about this who I was talking to who could potentially do due diligence for me. And uh, it wasn't a comfortable conversation, but it was a very useful one. She basically said, look, your plan isn't clear enough. It's not focused enough. Come back when you've got uh, a better version, which I went away and did. So I think having a really, really clear plan is important in your own business. But when you're acquiring a business, um, you're dealing with such big numbers in one go that I think having a really clear plan, you're, what are you going to buy? Why are you going to buy it? What, what is it going to do for you? Uh, is, are you planning to go a lot of wealth and retire by selling the business in three years time for twice what you bought it for or 10 years? What's the time frame? Um, I do need cash flow, you know, so why are you buying it? And then what's your plan to grow it or, you know, improve the cash flow of it or to sell it? What is your longer term arc? And particularly if you're looking at, at getting equity investors, they really, really want to know the answers to that. Anyone with spare money that's big enough to make a difference to buying a business is normally pretty savvy and demanding of a return. And then also the lenders will want to see that you're a credible person with a clear plan as well. So having a clear plan is always important. But I think as operators, owner operators of businesses we kind of get away with operating month to month maybe year to year whereas when you're buying i think it forces a discipline on you that's much better which is what's your plan for the next five years and on the selling side of the business you know to some degree you've got to do the same as well if you're going to sell the business to 
effectively sell the vision of the business to a buyer. You've got to sell the future effectively. So say we've launched X products and we've grown at this rate, but we haven't sold in the US yet. And there's a big market there. And, you know, we've done our research. We haven't had the capital to do it. But if you've got the capital, you could double this business in a year. So that's the sort of thing a buyer wants to hear. And you can only do that if you've speculated forwards or not. You planned forwards from where you're at now into what will this be? or What could it be in the future? So I guess to put that in a nutshell, it's about what's your plan for the future, not just about now and the past numbers as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Where can our listeners find out more about you? So if you go to the podcast, so you go to amazingfba.com, which is the main website, you can find out any um, everything we, that happens there, uh, or you go and uh, listen to the podcast, um, Amazing FBA is the overall podcast channel 10k collective is the focus which is most of the content now for six and seven and eight figure amazon sellers um so any podcast out near you those are the best places and if you want to get hold of me um easiest to email me michael m-i-c-h-a-e-l at amazing fba that's foxtrotbravoalpha.com perfect thank you so much yeah, okay. my pleasure it's been good fun